<laughs> yeah, great. So uh, thanks for the invitation. It's always nice to be back in Berkeley. So every, I'll be talking about some joint work with Tom Gannon, who's currently a postdoc at UCLA. Uh, so the talk will be a mix of uh, a classical topic, uh, which is the base affine space of a reductive group and its, uh, its ring of differential operators, and then a more modern topic, which is the theory of Coulomb branches and their quantization. Um, so I'll start by giving some background on the classical part. Then I'll say some stuff about the kind of modern part, and then I'll talk about some results that relate the two. Um, so let's start with the base affine space. So to fix just a little bit of Lie theoretic notation in the beginning here, uh, let me write G for a simple algebraic group over C. Right, B for a Borel. U, as in the U up there, that will be the unipotent radical of B. And then T will be the maximal torus. All right, so at some point, so in the beginning of the talk, I'll let G be in this generality. At some point, we'll just go ahead and specialize to the case where G is SLN, so you might as well also just uh, fix that for now if you like, in which case, of course, I have in mind B is uh, upper triangular matrices with determinant one, and then U is the subgroup where I just have ones on the diagonal, and then T is just the diagonal matrices. All right, so there's our Lie theoretic context. And then the base affine space of G is just the quotient of uh, G by multiplication by U. So this is the base affine space. G. And for a long time, this has been understood to be a fundamental object in uh, representation theory. So I'll at least uh, give a few kind of indications of why that is. First, let me say a little bit about what kind of thing this is. Uh, so the main thing to say is that it's a quasi-affine variety, which means that uh, when I look at the map, from this quotient to spec of its ring of regular functions, uh, this map is an open immersion. So with that in mind, that right hand, that affine variety on the right, I'll also denote, write this as G mod u bar. All right, so G mod u, it's an open subset of an affine variety. Um, we have some natural uh, kind of obvious symmetries on this. So the multiplicative action of G times G on itself by left and right multiplication descends to an action of G times T on G mod U, and then by extension also on uh, its coordinate ring, and hence on the spec of its coordinate ring. Um, so if I think about, we talked a little bit about the, both of these actions, if we think about this T action here, so that action is still free. Um, and if I take the quotient of that, I just get the quotient of G mod B. So I get the flag variety. So G 
mod u is a torus bundle, a T bundle, over the flag variety, which of course, far from being quasi-affine, is projective. So this is a kind of, yeah, if you like a quasi-affine uh, uh, counterpart to the flag variety. And then if I look at the, the residual G action here, well, as I said, this action also, it induces an action on the coordinate ring. So I can ask, what does the coordinate ring look like as a representation of the group G? Uh, and the basic result that one finds is that um, this is just the direct sum of all of the simple representations of G. So this is maybe the most kind of elementary statement that lets one kind of see why this should be a fundamental object, as I said. The sum of all of the simple G representations is in a sense, you know, one of, one of the most canonical G representations you could write down. So here we're saying you take that canonical G representation and there's a canonical algebra structure in, on that, in fact. And then we're studying the spectrum of that kind of canonical uh, algebra associated G. So let's see. Let's just talk through how all this fits together when uh, G is SL2. Well, of course, what are the simple representations of SL2? Well, they're just the symmetric powers of uh, C2. And of course, it's imme immediately evident that the sum of those is an algebra. It's the symmetric algebra on C2. So that's what this coordinate ring is here. And here it's obvious that this is a ring. And of course, the spec of this ring is just C2. I'm sorry, can you just tell me again? Mm -hmm. uh, I just, I lost the whole part. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the relation between simple and simple representations and demand. I did just this, like the isomorphism classes of simple SL2 representations is just this set of symmetric powers. And so I'm saying, look at the direct sum of those. Of course, you already know that that's naturally a ring. So spec of that is, in this case, what this affine closure is going to be. Uh, it's, uh, no, I'm saying uh, this is, in other words, the, like the, the sum of the symmetric powers is the definition of the symmetric algebra, which is, of course, an algebra. So what's spec of that algebra now? That's going to be C2, and that's what I've told you the general kind of formula is for um, Or this affine closure is, it's spec of an algebra that has this form as a G-rep. Uh, and inside here, so here this is an affine variety, what is the actual quotient here? That should be some open subset in here, and it's just the complement of the origin. Right, so that basic example of a, a, 
quasi-affine variety. It's not actually affine. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, maybe let me write it like this. Take the set, like the set of all simple S isomorphism class of SL2. Is there a direct map between the rest of the and the two What's the map? What's the ah, SL2 acts on C2, so it acts, it's acting on the symmetric power. This is just another description of what are the. Is this a. Is this short while? It's just this is just a particular description of the highest weight representations of so like the the three dimensional oh, sorry, sorry, yeah sorry, okay. just elementary yeah yeah yeah. Um, yeah I'm just writing them yeah, in a certain yeah, way to, yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay so here's these two things and then of course you also already know what's the maximal torus of SL two it's just C star of course there's a C that corresponds to the natural C star action here uh, and of course what is that quotient Well, it's just P1, which is, of course, the flag variety of SL2. All right, so that's how all the kind of general characters over here get realized in this um, simple case. Uh, one caution. Uh, so this is a good example, but maybe the um, main thing which is misleading about the SL2 case is the smoothness of this closure C2. So in fact, SL2 is the only group for which this affine closure is a smooth variety. In general, this quotient will be smooth, but the closure of it will contain some interesting singularities. So the point is that they will not appear, well, not the point, but a fact is that they do not appear with multiplicities. You will see every irreducible representation <clears throat> when I take the coordinate ring and I look at it uh, and I de decompose it into irreducibles, I will see each isomorphism class appearing exactly once, just as I do. That is a, uh, a non-misleading feature of this example. All right, so there's the base of fine space. Uh, you know, we've talked about its ring of regular functions now, sort of equally uh, important and interesting is its ring of differential operators. So I'll write this as D, I'll use the more precisely asymptotic notion of differential operators. So I'll have a parameter H bar in here. So again, this is a very classical thing to study in uh, Lie theory. So for example, the famous paper of Berenstein, Gelfand, and Gelfand, which introduced what we call BGG resolutions now. About half of that paper is just devoted to a detailed study of uh, the structure of this ring here. Um, one thing that's interesting about it in particular, and is kind of uh, a new feature that's different from just studying G mod U itself, uh, is that there's some um, interesting new symmetries here. So this was a construction um, introduced by Gelfand and Graev, and then they, they showed that there's uh, a canonical action of the vial group on this ring. So for example, in this SL2 case, 
So what's this ring of differential operators? So we've seen SL2 mod U, or its affine closure is just C2. So this is equivalently just differential operators on C2. So in other words, it's the tensor algebra of say symbols x, y, partial x, partial y. And again, I'm looking at the asymptotic version with a parameter h bar, mod calculus relations. So for example, mod the relation that the commutator of x and partial x is h bar. So there's the ring of differential operators. And now this has, so what's the vial group of S2, which just, uh, of SL2, which is the symmetric group S2. And this has an involution given by taking the Fourier transform. So, so if I switch X, and partial y and y and minus partial x, um, I get an involutive automorphism of this ring. And then the, the statement is that that's something that generalizes now if I replace SL2 with a general G, there's a similar action where I replace S2 with the vial group of G. Um, and I say this is kind of hidden or it's a kind of quantum symmetry in the sense, this is not something that's coming from for example, a vial group action on G mod U itself. It's something that uh, is mixing um, regular functions and different and honest differential operators. How do you see that? And again, uh, it's a Fourier transformation. In general? Uh, well, even in this case. So in this case, it's just you you can look at this formula and you know write out the full list of relations and you just check by inspection that. If you uh, probably, let me try not to say it in real time. Um, the, the main point I wanted to make is that, so in the, when I look in the general case, the, this action, I see it, a kind of mysterious feature of this action is that the generators can be written down via uh, kind of similar formulas as kind of partial Fourier transforms in certain directions corresponding to the simple roots. But it's very non-trivial. The, the most non-trivial part here is that those generators satisfy the relations of the vial group. So better understanding those relations is something that has been kind of a, a topic of ongoing interest, even kind of in the past few years. Uh, work of Ginsburg and Kajdan um, have studied this. Yeah, so just, uh, how do you see that it's kind of a that, that, that the vial group is fixed as to what? Um, of course, the, there is an action like that, but maybe the point is that action does not generalize in an interesting way. Yeah, this is the kind of interesting thing in a way that will be further borne out when we get later in the talk. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, Yes, so in that case, so in, yeah, in this semi-classical limit where I send h bar to zero, I get functions on the cotangent bundle of C2. And then this is a symmetry which is exchanging the, it's ex exchanging the base directions for the cotangent directions. Um, yes, it somehow generalizes the higher cases. Yeah. That's right. It's the same thing. Yeah. So just to write what I said, so the action for general G is generated by partial for a transforms. Um, but relations are mysterious.
All right. Uh, and by wonderful coincidence, so I finished the part of the talk uh, on the base affine space exactly after getting through uh, both boards. Uh, so before I move on to Coulomb branches, any further questions? Uh, so I think the answer is that, for, I mean, from the, I'm not sure, for example, if you just, so again, because we're talking about uh, this ring of kind of global differential operators, the distinction, I'm not seeing the distinction between G mod U and G mod U bar anymore. Uh, and I'm not sure if you just handed me, I actually don't know if you just handed me even the coordinate ring of G mod U. Um, so that would, from the coordinate ring, I write down G mod U bar as its spec. Is there a canonical way where I would think to name the open subset, which is G mod U, if I didn't start with that realization? I'm not sure that, it, I actually don't know an answer to that question. Right. Look, I can even just erase this and I've set up. How nice is that? <laughs> okay. Um, so Coulomb branches are certain uh, geometric objects attached to uh, supersymmetric QFTs uh, on non-compact spacetimes. Uh, the case that we'll be interested in is the case of uh, a 3D N equals four field theory. So associated to such a theory on R3, uh, I have its Coulomb branch. Um, M sub C T. So the physical interpretation of this won't be too directly relevant for us, but I'll, maybe it'll come up more in the second talk. Um, but the role of this is to parameterize certain vacua for this theory. Which are needed to make sense of expectation values of this theory on R3. terms of what is the geometry that we're going to be interested in here. For our purposes, um, the important thing will be that we can realize uh, MC of T as an affine variety, complex affine variety, um, uh, with a natural quantization. So if there's a deformation of the coordinate ring of this variety involving a parameter, which I'll again write h bar. So in particular, again, in the semi-classical limit, when I take this h bar to be equal to zero, this induces a, a, a algebraic symplectic structure on this underlying affine variety. In fact, there's a hyperkähler structure, but that again is something that won't play a role for us. Um, and from a mathematician's point of view, I mean, one of the things that's uh, kind of in particular very interesting about these spaces is that lots of objects that are already of interest to and actively studied by mathematicians can be realized as uh, the Coulomb branches of suitable QFTs. So it's an interesting framework for thinking of lots of things that um, are already interesting in mathematics. And indeed, the results that I'll be talking about in a minute are a kind of another variation on that principle. So uh, to zoom in a little bit more on uh, the particular cases we'll care about, so we'll be focused on uh, gauge theories in particular. So let me take G to be a group as before, complex algebraic group. Let me take uh, 
um, capital N to be a representation of G. So associated to this, I have a 3dn equals 4 gauge theory. Right as t g comma n, maybe more invariantly, this is associated to n plus n dual. Uh, and in this case, uh, Braverman and Finkelberg Nakajima gave a realization of the, the Coulomb branch, or if you like a definition, uh, in term in the kind of um, language of geometric representation theory. So they realized this space as, or this algebra as a certain uh, homology algebra. And their prescription says that quantized Coulomb branch of this theory is the equivariant borel mohr homology of a certain space on Gn. This space has a certain convolution structure on it, which induces a ring structure on this homology. So here, um, to clarify, so that's the kind of general framing here of the definition. What are these different things over on the right hand side um, to say a few words about that. So here, what is the group that is acting here that I'm working equivalently with respect to? Um, so this G sub O, this is the space of G valued formal power series in a variable right as t. So for example, if g is gln, this is literally just invertible matrices with power series entry. Uh, with c star acting by scaling t. So that's the group. And then what's the space rgn? So this lives over the affine Grassmannian GER G so that's the quotient by G sub O of the loop group of G K is G valued formal Laurent series. All right, so this is some space that lives over this homogeneous space for the loop group of G. And the fibers are things that kind of measure the G representation N. So with So if I pick an element of the loop group, an element of the loop group gives me a point in the affine Grassmannian. And what's the fiber of the projection? So I'm saying this projects on the affine Grassmannian. So to first approximation, to tell you what the space is, I should tell you these fibers. And I just take the intersection
So I can also look at n valued power series. That's a subspace of n valued Laurent series, but also acting by G is going to move this subspace in here to a different subspace, and I can take the intersection of those. All right, so that's what this space is. It's some um, uh, kind of big thing living over this, uh, this Grossmannian. Uh, and again, there's a convolution structure here I won't say much about, but it in particular kind of involves the multiplication induced by the loop group here. All right, so that's this uh, paradigm. And so again, for us, we'll, this will be the, the definition of the Coulomb branch that we'll work with in formulating various results. All right, so even more, so there's the Coulomb branches of uh, 3D n equals 4 gauge theories, or gauge theories of cotangent type. Uh, and even more specifically, what we'll care about are quiver gauge theories. So for, so this is the case where Suppose I have a quiver Q, so a finite directed graph. And let's say I have a function, I have a labeling of its vertices by natural numbers. So I can think of that as a function D. From vertices to N. So associated with this quiver, I can Cook up a group and a representation. So the group will be the product over the vertices of uh, the general linear group of dimension uh, given by our, our labeling here. And maybe for the version that we'll care about, I take the quotient of this by C star. So C star embeds diagonally into the product of the centers of these groups. So actually, I'll mod out by that. <clears throat> and then N sub Q. So this group naturally acts on a direct sum over the edges, where I take um, the space of linear maps from C D of V. The C D of W. So I have this product of general linear groups acting on this direct sum of matrix spaces. All right, and then the terminology, so we call the associated gauge theory a quiver gauge theory. All right, so there uh, are quiver gauge theories and their Coulomb branches. Now I can state a first theorem here. Um, so let me write Tn for the gauge theory associated to the following quiver. Um, On one end, I will have a bunch of vertices labeled N, and then these are attached 
to an A-type quiver with descending indices like this. Right, so there's a labeled quiver. And claim there is an algebra isomorphism. this quantized Coulomb branch and the ring of differential operators on the base affine space of SLN. And moreover, this identifies the gelfon of action. So in this case, this will be an action by the symmetric group Sn on the ring of differential operators. So this is identified um, with the Sn action. Induced. So this Coulomb branch will inherit an action by any symmetries of this graph. And of course, there's an obvious SN action on this graph just by permuting the vertices over here. Something like, yeah, yeah. All right. And there are some other structures, gratings, et cetera, that are present that this plays well with. Um, all right. So there's, um, okay. So first thing to say is that this kind of inspiration for this was um, that this should be the case was proposed by in work of Dancer, Hanani, and Kerwin. So a correlate in particular, as I said before, uh, this uh, isomorphism of algebras with H bar induces an isomorphism. If I can take the specialization of H bar to zero. So they conjectured or, uh, that there is an algebraic symplectic isomorphism uh, between, so again, I can take the cotangent bundle of SLN mod U Again, that will be quasi-affine, so I can take its um, affine closure, and this should be isomorphic to the Coulomb branch. So they gave some kind of numerical reasons why this should be expected, and observed that in if you look for small values of n, this quiver will be, uh, say, like affine D4 type, and in those cases, you can, these Coulomb branches have been explicitly computed uh, in other ways, uh, and then you can just check that it works out in those cases. Um, so that's one case. Uh, more generally, so we uh, kind of formulated and proved a generalization of this idea. All right, so now let me take um, So let me let N1 through NK be an ordered tuple of, uh, of natural numbers which sum to N. All right, 
So if I give myself such a tuple, so I have a corresponding um, unipotent character. So, so these tuples are in bijection. Let me write it out this way with um, functions. Psi from the set one through n, which I'll go ahead and write e one through e n, to zero and one. So, for example, um, so let me not write this out explicitly, but uh, psi constantly zero corresponds to the tuple where I just have one n times, which I want to think of as kind of labeling the right side of that diagram. Uh, and at the other extreme, I have psi constantly one. Such functions correspond to the tuple where I just have n. So that I use the notation E1 through EN there because I want to think of those as the generators for the Lie algebra of U. So any such psi extends to a Lie algebra character. So I'll write U, that frac U is the Lie algebra of U. And then I can extend this thinking of the EIs as uh, Chevrolet generators of U. I can extend Psi um, to a character like this. Uh, and now what do I want to do with this? Well, the action of U on SLN extends to a Hamiltonian action on the cotangent bundle. And I have the moment map for that action. No, it's going to be a little different. It's going to be, I'm going to look at, uh, it, I'm, I'm going to, I'm still modding by you, but I'm going to change the character of the reduction. So it's a different kind of generalization than that. Um, so let me write. Uh, moment map mu p star SLN to dual. Right, so now given psi, we have a Hamiltonian reduction. So all right, T star SLN mod mod u over psi. This is the pre-image of psi under the moment map, just mod u in the, in the ordinary quotient sense. So for example, when I take the zero, uh, when I take the pre-image of zero under the moment map, This is just the same as um, taking the cotangent bundle of the quotient on the base 
and then take its affine closure. So in particular, varying psi, I get uh, a family of generalizations of this um, algebraic symplectic variety. All right, and then the claim is that this family of uh, reductions is the family that corresponds to generalizing the right-hand side of that quiver in the obvious way. Now I'll just write T psi for the gauge theory, quiver gauge theory uh, associated to the same quiver, but modifying the right hand side. star SLN mod mod U with respect to psi and the Coulomb branch of this theory. All right. So another way in the spirit of uh, Nina's earlier question, if I say start with the theory where I, I uh, just have a, a GLN flavor symmetry on the right on um, um, from Cn minus one to n, and I ask what happens when I gauge the different Levy subgroups of that GLN. This is saying that there's a kind of uniform answer for the things you get. It's explicitly this fam family of Hamiltonian reductions of T star SLN. Yes, because uh, the size of one to the other side. Oh yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, so let me say a few just words about some of the key ingredients in the proof uh, that we take from the literature. That's right. Yeah. So, the, yeah. So the that corresponds to the the so-called Whitaker character, um, and there's kind of a in many ways the the Whitaker reduction is geometrically much kind of simpler than the you can think as the, we kind of collapse all these ones into a single n. Actually, the Whitaker reduction is smooth, whereas I'd pointed out um, you know this variety except for SL two. This is a, a singular variety. It has kind of complicated singularities uh, at the other. So the, meanwhile, the Whitaker direction is smooth. And in fact, it's just, um, uh, yeah, the geometry is much uh, simpler there. I forget, I was gonna say something, it's the product of something in the cost and slice, but I forget. SLN times it's SLN times the cost and slice, yeah. Um, all, all the same dimension. Yes. No, they're not. And you can, you can again, like uh, in this extremal case, you have something smooth that becomes kind of very singular in that case. And you can kind of think in that's kind of interpolated between the singularities kind of become simpler and simpler as I kind of start collapsing the, the factors. Um, 
That's right. So then you just have a, an A type quiver, um, and that case is kind of very well studied and understood. So that compu the computation of what is this, the Whitaker version of this, you know, I'm sure that appears in the physics literature long before, but in like in the BFN ring objects paper, you can see that computation there. Um, all right, so in the proof of this, again, let me kind of list this. I, let, me, let me get back to that in a second. There should be. We, um, so the key ingredient A few key ingredients that we use all involve the regular sheaf. Um, so this is the, maybe I'll say, A rig G. This will be an element of the Satake category. So perverse, um, or maybe in perverse. Geo equivariant constructible sheaves on uh, on the Affine Grassmanni and Gur G. So the geometric Satake equivalent says that this category is equivalent to representations of the dual group of G. So there's an object in here corresponding to the regular representation of the dual group, the coordinate ring of G check. Um, and I'll write that like this. Right, so this uh, object plays a, I mean, there's, it's been studied by many op authors um, in uh, related contexts. So in particular to the arm board for us, are on one hand a result of Ginsburg and Riesch. So they show that uh, differential operators on the base affine space can be extracted from this. If I take the T sub O by C star equivariant cohomology of the shriek restriction of the regular sheaf to the Grismanian of the torus. All right, so if I have the regular sheaf, there's a geometric description for. Oh. Uh, so this regular sheaf, is it really an end object? That's right, it's really an end perverse sheaf. Okay. But so uh, on the one hand, this is known to be related to differential operators on the base of Hahn space. And on the other hand, it's also known to be related to Coulomb branches. So um, something that a result of BFN, that A reg of PGLN is the push forward to GER PGLN of the dualizing sheaf of the space associated to the Whitaker version of that quiver gauge theory. Um, So um, 
Yeah, so between Ginsburg Reach and BFN, uh, we can kind of, that gives us a connection between Coulomb branches and differential operators. And then by playing various sheaf theoretic games from there, we can extract the, um, the statement that we want from here. For the statement here, we can do a similar thing, except now um, the work of Ginsburg Reich has a generalization due to Maserata. Is Mark in this room? It's not in this room, okay. Uh, <laughs> so we were, uh, but so we're, we're using some recent results of Mark. Um, so generalization, so he generalized the relevant part. Our, um, to the case where T is replaced by a levy. And he computed that in the corresponding statement, one meets the non-zero re uh, reductions of T star, uh, he, of, of T star G check. Um, he did, his work does not consider explicitly the role of loop rotations, and that's the reason why this theorem here is stated at the classical level and not the quantized level. Uh, all right, I think that's uh, what I have to say then. So thanks a lot for your attention. Mm -hmm. So the practice that you take for reduction, is that pretty much the same practice you would take for you also to make a non zero slice for well, suppose you want to do custom mode reduction for a slice to a non zero for that. Uh, but the, the practice that you take that's uh -huh. with the representative circle that the non zero circle holds. So one would That's right, that's right. So every every orbit is represented by yeah, such a side. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Okay. So in, yeah, as, I mean, as there's a, a family of generalizations relate indexed by the same data where I would replace U by uh, the human radical of, radical of a parabolic labeled by Psi. Uh, uh, and in, uh, I believe that Dancer, Hanani, Kirwan, they, so they don't talk about this picture, but they talk about, they make a proposal, I believe, for the quiver that would correspond to that generalization where instead you replace each of these legs, which with another, um, a quiver whose length corresponds to the, now corresponds to the, the, uh, the entries in the partition. So uh, I was gonna ask if, um, if there's any useful sense in which I can think of these spaces as sort of like further reduction. So if I did like the, the honest full customer for reduction, then I would get something that looks like SLN times a load of these legs for mm -hmm. uh, an offense for that. And then is there a sense in which there's like some residual like n action or n being like some splitting of your U into um, a subgroup that stabilizes my character and just works to that? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, that seems pretty plausible, but I don't know an answer offhand. Hi, um, I'm on, I'm on Zoom. Can you guys hear me? I, I mean, it's a very non-trivial result. I mean, <laughs> I mean the, yeah, there's not a, a pithy answer to that. Mm -hmm. Ah, yes. So again, that uh, yeah, or more like naive, like uh, in the specific sense that I said, you would get the nilpotent cone is uh, um, 
there. And that, I mean, the, the way that we approach these theorems, and so that, that case is in particular is studied in the context of this uh, ring object picture in the ring object paper of BFN, and our whole kind of approach to these is to kind of ver just, um, it's a variation on the way that they deal with that case. So if you like, that's something about if you take if you shriek restrict from Gurji to the identity point in the Grismanian. Um, and kind of we're pursuing the same kind of analysis, but now replacing the, the identity point with the Grismanian of T or of more generally a Levy subgroup. Certainly, we have not thought about a direct answer to that question, but I can imagine so. Um, yeah, but I don't have a, a kind of immediate answer. Mm -hmm. So what is, um, what is free, is free engineering symmetry saying in this case? Like the, is the left hand side looks kind of like a bit strange. Ah, the... Like you're taking a, the, what's it called, the almost say, say There is, I think there's a good, um, Let's see, what's, uh, what to say? I think in the, in the all ones case, so in the, the original case that I talked about, there's a good picture of how, we, so we don't use, we use a kind of sheaf theory toolkit. Uh, I think there is a good 3D mirror perspective on that, um, starting from this quiver where you just have the framed and at the end, uh, this is, uh, so that's a self mirror quiver. And there's a description of the, P star SLN mod U at, essentially as a Higgs branch where you replace the UN factors in there with, S, with SUN factors. And I think there's a picture where uh, incorporating those U1, I'm not gonna say the right physics words, but, uh, uh, and I'm mostly trying to explain the same things that I learned from Tudor, uh, replacing those SUNs with UNs should correspond to gauging some U1s on the Coulomb side. So it makes sense from that point of view why you see that uh, the answer you get on the Coulomb side has these extra U1 symmetries. I don't think there's a good 3D mirror picture of what happens with you know, gauging these non-abelian factors over here. So I think that part is, that, that the generalization I think is more mysterious from the 3D mirror picture. But I, maybe other people have um, better things to say. Yeah, I mean, this is a, uh, I don't know, maybe a question I was hoping to ask people around here. <laughs> yeah, so of course, from this point of view, all of these varieties sit together in a family, which would be, you know, there's a Poisson variety, T star SLN, just ordinary quotient U. And each of these are just, you know, fibers of that space over the moment map. So these spaces all fit together naturally from the point of view of this geometry, like the spaces that I get by varying the, the partition over here. Um, is there a, a physics picture for why those Coulomb branches should fit together? I don't know. That's, yeah, my question for you guys. <laughs> Mm 
Yeah, unitary group. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't have any interesting buckets, but I think the only thing here. Okay, the one question at the time is super good. Great. <laughs>